So we are in this series called Pray This Way. It's based on the, uh, the model prayer that Jesus gave us. His disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And in response to that request, Jesus gives us this model prayer. And each week we've been looking at a different line of the model prayer. Today's message is entitled Obeying God's Commandments. But, but another title could be today, Resisting Temptation. Of course, in order for us to obey God's commandments, that means we've got to resist the temptations that we face every day. So today we're going to be talking about equipping us to do a better job of having victory over the temptations that we face. Now I've got a list of what have been called years ago. They made up this list called the seven deadly sins. Here they are. Lust, gluttony, greed, laziness, wrath, envy, pride. Now I want to keep that up on the screen for a minute. I'm going to ask you all to participate with me in this. Okay. And I want everybody to participate. If you don't participate, I'm going to get angry. And when I get angry, I preach long. Now, I preach long whether I'm angry or not. <laughs> but, but I want everybody to participate, all right? So I want you to look at this list. On this list, you probably see one or two that you feel like I don't struggle with those at all. For example, for me, laziness is not a temptation for me. I am a driven person. I work hard. I work long hours. And I love doing that. I love the feeling of accomplishment, of getting things done, working hard, and feeling like, all right, it was worth it. I love that. So that's not really a struggle for me. But some people struggle with that. But maybe it's not that. Maybe it's, it's lust. I, I saw a survey done recently where it said 97% of men admitted to lusting. The other 3% admitted to lying. <laughs> Just saying. Lust could be the struggle that you have. Uh, maybe gluttony. Uh, gluttony, by the way, is a big problem in America with the abundance of food that we have and the accessibility to food. Gluttony is a real sin problem in America. But it's more than just food. Gluttony also involves overindulgence in alcohol and things like that. It's just an overindulgence and abuse of, of going overboard with things. Well, it might be greed for some people. Uh, and it doesn't matter how much money you have. Greed can be a struggle for anybody at any economic level. It might be uh, laziness, as I said, or, or wrath, that anger. Uh, sometimes, you know, anger. Anger itself is not a sin, but it can lead you to sin. Uh, it can cause you to commit sin. And then uh, we have envy, uh, where you are envious of other people and what they have, and our pride, where the ego gets in the way, gets out of control. All of those have been listed as kind of the seven deadly sins. Now, this list is not exhaustive. You could break sin down into a whole lot of other categories, too. Uh, lying is not on the list. That's one. You know, there's a lot of different ones you could put on the list. But I want you to do this mental exercise with me right now, looking at the list. Pick two that you think are your greatest struggle. You don't have to reveal it. You don't have to share it with anybody. This is between you and God. Pick two that you think are your greatest struggle in your life right now. So just take a moment, look at it, think hard, be honest about this, and try to pick the two that you think are the hardest battle for you. Because what we're going to do in the rest of the time today is talk about how we can do better and having victory over those areas of struggle in our lives. And I want you to know this. The truth of the matter is, there's not a single person in this room that doesn't struggle with some of these. Okay? Everybody in this room, myself included, we all battle with these areas of temptation. Every single person. So don't act like you don't. Don't try to put on some show here of self-righteousness. This is a battle we all have. So pick the two that you think are the greatest struggle for you. Now, regardless of which one of these you identify as your weakness, it illustrates the fact that you do have some weaknesses. And so do I. Christians are tempted to do wrong. I don't think anybody looked at that list and said, none of those apply to me at all. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, it says this. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Peter says, these temptations, facing these temptations is a war for the Christian. It is an ongoing battle. And we are on the battlefield every day, every night, all day long, all night long. We are on that battlefield doing battle with those temptations that we're facing. 
And we come to this phrase in the Lord's Prayer today in Matthew 6 and verse 13. And it teaches us to pray this way. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now that line in the prayer is more complex than most of us want to think it is. And I want us to break it down today, unpack it a little bit more, and, and really get what God, what Jesus is teaching us to pray like, okay? How he wants us to pray when it comes to facing these temptations that we face. Obviously, it doesn't mean don't lead us anywhere where we're going to be tempted to do wrong. You know why it can't mean that? Because that would mean we would all be taken off of the face of the earth at one time right now. Because if you live on the earth, you live in the middle of of temptations there's no way around it this is a fallen world and we're in the flesh which is a fallen flesh inclined towards sin so all of us every day while we have another day of life on the earth it's on this earth anywhere you go on this earth there are going to be temptations you think you could get away from it sometimes even monks that that isolate themselves in a monastery they still face temptation every one of them You cannot escape this. So let's not think that what this prayer means is God just just put me in this place where I'm not tempted anymore. That's, That's not possible on this earth. So that prayer can't mean that. In fact, when you read scripture, honestly, God sometimes leads us into those places where there are serious temptations there. Remember when he called Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt? Egypt was a sinful place. Moses had to go there. He had to live there. He had been raised there. He had to to face all of those temptations around him when he was there. But that was God's call for him to go there and do that. So so this prayer can't mean God only put me in a place where I'm not going to have any temptations. Even Jesus himself. Remember when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist? It says right after that, he was led into the wilderness. Led by the Spirit, by the way. Into the wilderness And there, what was going to happen to him? He's going to be tempted for 40 days by the devil himself. So this prayer can't mean God only put me in places where I'm not going to have any temptation. Because you don't have a place like that on this earth and neither do I. It does not exist. Now some are worse than others. Obviously, we'll talk about that. But there's temptation everywhere. Remember, Jesus led his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was going to be betrayed and arrested and then taken to be crucified. He took them into the garden and he said, Now stay here and pray that you will not fall into temptation. You see, he knew that that was going to be a rough night for them. He knew that temptation was going to come upon them. He was not praying that they would not have any temptation. He was praying that they would not give in to and act on the temptation. Not that there would not be any temptation. If they're going to live on the earth, there was going to be temptation. If they're going to follow Jesus, there's going to be temptation. So this prayer can't mean put us somewhere where there's no temptation. Even if you follow God's will in your life, you will still encounter temptation. I want you to know that. Even if you're the most solid Christian man or woman on the face of the earth, you're still going to face what? Temptation. Now, here's what you need to know. That's not sin. For you to be tempted is not sin. For me to be tempted is not sin. In fact, the scripture says that Jesus himself was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. So the temptation itself is not a sin. We need to stop acting like just being tempted means you're bad and you're sinful. No, it doesn't. It's what you do with the temptation. It's how you respond to to the temptation that determines whether or not it produces sin in your life. So when we're praying this prayer, we're not saying, I want to be somewhere where there's no temptations. That's not what he's saying. Temptation for us as Christians should be now viewed as a call to battle. Because as Christians, we should never welcome sin into our lives. Sin should be seen as the enemy. So if sin is the enemy, then when we face the temptation to sin, what we're doing is coming face to face with the enemy in a real battle that's about to take place. So this prayer is really about girding us up for battle. It's about preparing us for those temptations that we are obviously going to face in this world. 
That we will not be led into it and ill-equipped for it and not prepared for it and give into it and sin when we face it. That's what this prayer is really all about. Here's what you need to know about God. God never tempts a person to do evil. Ever. That is never the work of God when we are tempted to sin. In James 1, 13 and 14, James said this. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. If you are feeling temptation at any point in your life, any day, you can know for sure it's not God causing you to be tempted. It's not the work of God. God does not tempt anyone and he cannot be tempted himself. So the next time you yell at somebody with road rage, don't say, God, why did you put all these bad drivers out here? All right? Those bad drivers chose to be out there. That wasn't God's plan. That's their choice. So let's not blame God for something that God's not doing. So I want to go to the outline now. I want to spend the most time with number one here. Then we'll get to the others very quickly. The first thing on your outline is this. I want to re reveal to you from Scripture three sources of temptation. Okay? Here they are. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, and the, that means the peer pressure, the, the people around us, the circumstances, the environment that we're living in. The flesh, which is the flesh that we're born into that has natural inclination towards sin. And the devil. Because Satan is truly out there prowling around trying to persuade you and me to commit sin. It never originates with God. It always comes from one of those three sources that I just named. Now, I want you to understand the difference here. God does sometimes test us. But God never tests us with the intent of getting us to sin. It's just the opposite. He tests us to strengthen our faith. Now, you remember in the Old Testament, we looked at this story recently. It says God tested Abraham. Remember in the Old Testament? He told Abraham to do something that was very hard to understand, very hard to do, to sacrifice his son Isaac. God was not testing, testing Abraham to get him to sin. God was testing Abraham to get him to grow in his faith. See, God has a different motive behind testing than, we, than Satan does with temptation. God's motive with testing is to strengthen us and grow us. Satan's motive with temptation is to destroy us, to ruin us. Two completely different things. James 1 and verse 2, he says, Consider it joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why should we consider that joy? Well, he goes on to tell us that it's because the testing of our faith will grow us up and mature us and get us to a place where we persevere, where we're stronger than we were before. When we get through the testing, we'll be stronger. That's God's intent behind the testing in our lives. To strengthen us, to develop perseverance in our walk with Him. So let's not blame God for the temptations that we face. And when we give in to them and their problems, that's not the work of God. The work of God is to strengthen us and equip us to be mature and to persevere. So I understand lead us not into temptation to mean... Keep me from self-imposed and unnecessary temptations. Keep me so close to, to following Jesus that I have a power over the temptations that I am going to face every day. I think that's really the intent of this part of the prayer. Don't lead me into temptation. It's acknowledging that we are vulnerable and weak. In fact, when we pray, don't lead me into temptation, what we're really praying is, lead me away from it. Lead me to victory over it. That's what we're really praying. And we play a part in that, and God plays a part in that. We have some influence over that, and God has great influence over that. And it's us working together with God, staying close to Him, walking with Him, that gives us victory over those temptations that we're going to face. But when we pray it, what we're doing is admitting to God that we are weak in the face of temptations. It's humbling, isn't it? But we all have to confess that. Certain temptations especially, we're weaker in those areas than we are others. And the first step to getting help is admitting that you have a problem, right? So we need to come before God, confess our weakness in the face of temptation, and seek the help and the strength that only God can give us. It's a little bit like the, the little boy who saved up all winter to get a new baseball glove. 
And when the spring weather came and it started warming up, he almost had enough money to buy it. And he prayed this prayer. God, please don't let the ice cream truck come down our street today. (laughs) He just knew that would be the one, you know, that, that temptation would cause him not to be able to get the ball glove. When we pray, lead us not into temptation, we're saying, Lord, please don't let me get into that situation where I'm not likely to stay faithful to you. Do what's necessary to keep me from bringing self-imposed temptation on myself. In the book, The Prayer of Jabez by Bruce Wilkinson, he wrote this. Many of us face too many temptations and therefore sin too often because we don't ask God to lead us away from temptation. He said, we make a huge spiritual leap forward, therefore, when we begin to focus less on beating temptation and more on avoiding it. The most effective war against sin that we can wage is to pray that we will not have to fight unnecessary temptations. And God offers us supernatural power to do just that. So lead us not into unnecessary self-imposed temptation and deliver us from the evil one. It's both of those things. See, we play a role in this. We can choose not to go do certain things and be around certain things. But then there's some part of it that's out of our control. And we're asking God's help with that part too. And that is to deliver us from, who is it? The evil one. Way too many Christians take Satan way too lightly. We don't think of him as real. We don't think of him as actively involved in the things in the world, in our lives. But the scripture reveals him as being very real very active, very deceptive, very destructive. There is a spiritual adversary, the evil one, who seeks to entrap and enslave all of us. Jesus called him a murderer, a liar, and a thief who comes to kill and steal and destroy. That's Satan. He despises God so much that he wants to kill your relationship with him. He wants to steal your sense of purpose and your joy and your assurance of salvation. He wants to destroy your witness to the outside world on behalf of Christ. That's exactly what Satan's out to do. Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If any of you watch some of the specials on the Discovery Channel about the Animal Kingdom stuff? Any of you ever watch that? I, I, for some reason, I get into that. I like to watch that. I've seen one on lions. And lions have a certain approach they take to getting their prey. They will usually sit on the edge of a field, just hidden a little bit, in the tall grass or the woods. And they will watch a flock or a herd out in the field. Let's say it's a herd of wildebeest. Here's what they'll do. They will watch that herd of wildebeest and they will look for the weakest one in the herd. Okay? Might be sick. Might be hurt. Might be young. And then they'll look especially for one who tends to get a little separated from the rest. Okay? No longer close to the herd. They're a little bit out away from it. And that becomes their target. That's their prey. Because they know they've got a much higher percentage of success when they go after that one. And they don't want to work any harder than they have to. So they're going to get the one that's the easiest target. And they'll isolate that one. And then they prounce on that one. And they put a stranglehold on it until it's suffocated. And they'll eat what they want and leave the rest for the vultures. And they never feel bad about doing it. Ever. That's just what they do. And Peter says, Satan is just like that. He's looking at this room today. He's looking for people who are weak, maybe hurting or injured right now, maybe feeling discouraged. And maybe you're not connected to the body of Christ really at all. You're attending a service today, but you're not really connected and involved. You're isolating yourself from the herd. You're the prime target. For Satan. Because he knows it's easier to get you to fall. Than somebody who's actively involved. 
somebody who's got a good strong prayer life, somebody that's in the word every day. He knows it's easier to get somebody who's not taking care of those spiritual disciplines and get them to fall into temptation and cause the pain and the destruction that he can cause in your life and hurt other people through you too. And he doesn't care who gets hurt. Does it bother him at all that there's pain and suffering and heartache and despair? He loves that stuff. That's just who he is. That's his nature. We have to acknowledge that there's a real adversary out there. And we cannot do battle against him by our own strength, our own ingenuity, our own intelligence, and beat him. We need help. And we need the help that only God can give to have victory over a cunning adversary like Satan. But here's the good news. The Bible says, greater is he that is in us than he who is at work in the world. You see, with him, being close to him, being in him and him being in us and keeping that relationship where it needs to be, we have a strength greater than our own and greater than his. And that's where the victory comes. That's where the success comes in the battle. It's when we don't fight it alone. We fight it with the strength that only God can provide. God said through the psalmist in Psalm 50 and verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Now, if you're here today as a Christ follower, I pray that your greatest desire is what my greatest desire is. I want to honor God with my life. That's what I want more than anything else. Satan wants just the opposite for you. And for me. But if we're going to honor God with our lives, then we've got to do better in this battle with temptation, don't we? Because every time we lose this battle, God is dishonored by that. Every time. So if we're going to honor God, we need to be willing to call upon Him and His help, His power, His strength. Because we can't honor Him without that. We will fail. Satan is the evil one and he works also through evil ones. Sometimes we don't recognize the work of Satan because it comes wrapped up in a person. And the person may not even be aware that Satan's using them to cause that pain and that destruction and that hurt. But Satan works through other people to bring heartache and pain and destruction to those who want to honor God in their lives. That's why Paul warns us, warns us in 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 2, Speaking to Christians, he says, pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people because not everyone has faith. Not everyone cares about honoring God. Not everyone cares about you honoring God. In fact, they feel better if they're not honoring God if the people they're hanging out with aren't honoring God either. They feel more comfortable in that setting. So Satan uses those people around you to try to bring you to a decision to dishonor God in your life. You remember your parents saying, I don't think those are the people you ought to be hanging out with. Now, if they're good parents, they had good reason for saying that. Because you hang out with them enough, you become a lot like them. Whether you meant to or not. Your parents say, I don't think you ought to be dating that person. Why? Because that person's desire is not to honor God. That person's desire is to get what they want out of this relationship. It makes a difference, right? Because Satan works through people just like God works through people for his purposes. Young people, it may be a classmate who invites you to this party that you know is going to be not honoring God at the party. But you want to be popular. You want to be part of the group. You want to be in the in crowd. It could be and we do this year after year. We send our young people to liberal colleges with professors that seem to be so cool and so intelligent. And they stand up in a classroom and they find out you are a person of faith. And they have a mission to destroy that child's faith before they leave that class. Don't kid yourselves. We've got professors in schools all over the country that take pride in destroying a young person's faith. While they have them in their classroom. Satan can use a professor like that. To cause a lot of pain and heartache and destruction in somebody's life. It could be a promiscuous man or woman 
that's flirting with you and making you feel so good. Making you feel like, oh, I'm not getting that attention at home, but this person's giving it to me. This person recognizes that I'm, I'm, I look nice and I'm a good person and they, they compliment me. I don't get that some, anywhere else. And they're manipulating you to get what they want. And you're letting yourself buy into it because you're so hungry for that. And the end of that could be destruction and pain, heartache. Not just for you, but for your spouse, for children that are coming up in your family. They may have to pay the price for that for the rest of their lives. But that person's not going to tell you that on the front end. They're only going to tell you what you want to hear so they can get what they want out of that relationship. Proverbs 5, it talks about that. It says, for the lips of an adulteress drip honey. Her speech is smoother than oil, but in the end she's as bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. Keep a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. You see, because at that point she is the evil one that Satan is using to bring you down. That's why we need to pray daily. Deliver me from the evil one, Father. It's like the old country preacher used to say, if you don't intend on going in the house, then stay off the front porch. (laughs) Right? Don't connect yourself with places or people that you know when you look at their life, you can tell this is not a desire to honor God here. Why would I connect with that if I want to honor God? Those two can't go together. Jesus asked, what fellowship can light and darkness have together? They cannot exist together at the same time. So we've got to make better choices if we truly mean this prayer that we don't want to give in to temptation anymore. We play a part in that by the choices that we make. So we need to pray daily, deliver me from the evil one. Father, as I follow you today, help me not to be so naive as to get attracted to the bait that Satan's putting out there for me. Because hidden inside the bait is always a what? It's a hook. It's a trap every time. We've got to get better at recognizing the deception of the bait. And where it's leading us if we follow it. The Bible says come near to God and he will come near to you. That's the key. The closer you are to God, the closer you are in relationship with him, the more you recognize the deceptions out there. The more you recognize evil in light of God's goodness and holiness, you see the difference the closer you get to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, we are reminded though that God is in the business of delivering people when they cry out for help. He says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. He's saying, go into it on your own. You don't have that help. But if you go into any situation in life that you're going to face and you stay close to God when you're there, then you've got a strength and a power and a presence working on your behalf that that is greater than any power at work out there in the world. So, in the rest of the time we've got here, I want to very quickly talk about three things, practical suggestions that we can all do to help us have more and more victories as we face those temptations that we're going to face, okay? Three things all of us can do. Number two on your outline is this. Start by acknowledging your own weakness, It's got to start there. You can't get help until you admit you've got a problem, right? We all know that. If you've ever been through 12 steps or something like that, alcoholics and all anything, the first step is to acknowledge you've got a problem, right? Well, we've all got this sin problem, all of us. We all have this temptation problem that we're doing battle with every day. Every one of us faces temptation. So we've got to acknowledge our weakness right up front. We've got to go to God and be honest with God. Because when you get honest with God, it means you're getting honest with yourself, too. To confess this to God is to admit to yourself, this is a problem for me. And I'm willing to let God know that. I'm willing to confess that to Him. I struggle in this area, God. So let's acknowledge our own powerlessness against some of the temptations that we face. But you know what I've observed? I've observed that a lot of Christian people underestimate their ability to cope with suffering... 
and they overestimate their ability to cope with temptation. We see somebody else, some other Christian, going through some horrible circumstance, and we say, I don't know how they're doing it. I can never go through that. Well, you're underestimating what you could go through with God's help. God wouldn't allow you to have that circumstance if you didn't also already have in place what you need to get through it. Okay? So don't underestimate what God could get you through in your life, ever. But the second thing we do that's most deadly when it comes to temptation is we overestimate our ability to handle things on our own. We overestimate how strong we are. And we put ourselves in places and circumstances that we're really not as well equipped for as we think we are. Because we've overestimated our strength. Oh, I can go to that party without getting caught up in what they're going to be doing. I can go to Cancun on spring break with that group. And, and you know, we're going to be sharing hotel rooms with each other. I can handle that. We'll keep it where it needs to be, right? I can handle that. I could go to that liberal university without being influenced by that professor trying to challenge my faith. I, I, I'm strong enough for that. I, I could go to that Bible study that I know is not quite doctrinally correct and it won't influence what I believe, right? I could listen to that preacher on TV that's, that's not really teaching the truth without it getting me off track, right? I can go see that movie without it corrupting my thoughts even though I know what's in it is totally not honoring God I won't let that influence me I could go visit that porn site occasionally I'm not really caught up in it it's not going to control my life All right? I'm strong enough to look at that without it having an effect on me and changing what I do and how I act and what I say we overestimate our ability to have victory over those things on our own by our own strength and every time we overestimate our ability to handle it, Satan says, yes, that's exactly what I wanted you to do. I've got you right where I want you. Remember Peter on the night that Jesus was going to be betrayed. Jesus said, one of you is going to deny me. And he said, Peter, you're the one. And, and Peter said, not me, Lord. Uh-uh. I, I would die before I would ever turn my back on you, Jesus. Sounds really confident, right? And we hear Christian people stand up and give these testimonies about how strong they are and great victories. And we applaud them. Oh, great victories. You're so strong. You're so amazing. Yeah. And Satan's building their ego the whole time to make them think they're so great. So they overestimate their ability to handle the temptations that they're going to face in the near future. And we contribute to it because we talk about how great they are instead of how great God is. And they begin to believe what we're telling them. And they think they are great. And then they don't get prepared. Because they don't think they need to. For what's coming their way. The Bible says, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. Don't get overconfident. Gordon MacDonald said, an unguarded strength can become a double weakness. You catch that? An unguarded strength can become a double weakness. Here's why. You think you're so strong, you don't make any effort at all to put up a guard there. And that just opens the door to Satan right away. If you think you're that strong that you don't even have to keep a guard up anymore. It's a double weakness that Satan can use against you. So, the first thing is, confess your weakness to God. The second thing is this, number three on your outline. Pray daily for deliverance from temptation that day. We already looked at this series about how this is a daily prayer, right? Right? He says, give us when? Today, our daily, our daily bread. So this is obviously a prayer model that we're supposed to pray this way every single day. Because every single day, we're going to face what? Temptations every single day. Now, some days you're going to do better than others. And you're going to think, wow, I've been doing good. I don't have to pray that way today. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Because you're going to face temptations today. Every single day. Sometimes we get a little overconfident and we forget to pray the way we should every day. We don't know what every day is going to bring. When you get up out of the bed that morning and you start that day, you have no idea what you're going to face that day ahead of time. You just don't know how it could change that day, how circumstances could change that day. You don't know. You can't predict that. So you need to pray for help every day. 
I love the prayer somebody prayed like this way. Dear Lord, so far I've done all right. I haven't gossiped. I haven't lost my temper. I haven't been greedy or grumpy or nasty or selfish or overindulgent. And I'm really glad about that. But in just a few minutes, God, I'm going to get up out of bed. (laughs) And from then on, I'm going to need your help a lot. Now, some days you can anticipate some of the vulnerability you're going to face. You know maybe you work in an environment that's not very godly. You know some things in advance, but you can't predict everything. And just because you had victory yesterday doesn't guarantee victory today. So make sure you pray every single day for God to help you as you face those temptations. Well, the final thing is this. Number four in your outline. We all need to do our part to avoid the temptations that we can't avoid. We can do part of that ourselves. Some really easy examples. If you struggle with gambling, don't book a trip to Las Vegas. (laughs) Because as soon as you get off the plane at the airport, slot machines in the airport, right? I've been to Vegas. I'm not tempted to gamble. That doesn't bother me. But, But some people, that's all it takes is to walk past it. And see the flashing lights. That's, that's like, oh boy, flashing lights, you know. <laughs> I can gamble. I can lose all my money today in one day right here. <laughs> Don't put yourself intentionally in the place where you know you're vulnerable already. If you struggle with abusing alcohol, don't say to me, God has called me to a ministry to alcoholics in the bars in Nashville. I'm going to tell you, you're an idiot if you think that's where God has called you to serve. Don't put yourself in that environment if you struggle with alcohol abuse. It's the most ridiculous thing you could do. Now, you could still minister to alcoholics, but don't do it in the bars. Bring them onto your home turf now. Your home turf is not the bar anymore. Understand your vulnerabilities. Admit that to God and seek help from Him. And do your part to avoid the temptation. If you know you struggle with lust, don't play around with pornography. Don't go to those internet sites. Put some kind of filter on your computer. Get some accountability with some other people. Put your computer in a place where other people can see what you're looking at when you're on there. So you have that accountability. Don't put yourself in those places where you isolate your computer in a room where nobody else is there and you can look at whatever you want and nobody will ever see it. You're setting yourself up for failure every single time you do that. So do your best. As our praise team gets ready, I love what James says in James 1.12. He says, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. God wants to bless us with victories over our temptation. He wants, us to, he wants to bless us with victory over sin. We know that about God because that's exactly what the cross is all about. It's God saying to us, I have the power and I will pay the price for you to have victory over sin and the consequences of sin in your life. And the key to that victory is that relationship with Jesus. You can't have it without that. And today, if you're here and your relationship with Jesus is not what it needs to be, then the only way for you to put yourself in a position to have victory in your life is to connect with Jesus. It's to to enter into that relationship with Him and stay close to Him. That's the only way for you to have this victory that you want to have in your life. Stop trying to do it by your own strength, your own power. You will never win that way. Neither would I. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. If you're ready to come to Him today as we stand and sing, we invite you to come.